and rest in him. If you have your Bibles or if you simply want to read along, God's word comes to us again through Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to look and continue along the same verses that we looked at several couple of weeks ago. So Romans 12, verses 3 to verse 8. Romans 12, verses 3 to verse 8. If I could kindly ask everyone to please stand as a sign of reverence for the reading of God's word. Please give your undivided attention to his holy, inerrant, and his fallible word here this morning. This is what Paul writes. For For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. This is the word of our Lord. You may take your seats at this time. As we do so, if I could kindly ask everyone to please bow their heads with me and ask the Lord for the illumination of his Holy Spirit here this morning for the preaching of his word. Let us bow our heads in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again that you have gathered us here. We ask, Lord, at this time that you would, by your spirit and the truth of your word, Take capture of our hearts, Lord, and help us to understand. Lord, we pray, Father, that you would truly encourage us and convict us and conform us to the image of your Son, slowly but surely, even though we may not be able to discern or to detect in an evidential manner, Lord, we pray and trust that you truly are working within us the spirit-wrought work of your sanctification. So, Lord, we pray to that end, you would bless us here this morning with the preaching of your word. In Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. If you remember from a couple of weeks ago, if you were here with us on the Lord's Day worship, I talked about discerning God's will for your life. And this morning, I want to continue along those lines because when we think about God's will and discerning God's will, one of the great benefits is that if you keep reading along in the passage that God tells us for his church and for believers what his will is for our lives. And that's what the verses in verses 3 through 8 really talk about with respect to the church in its unity, but also with respect to the church in its diversity and individuality, and also how he appropriates that with reference to using our gifts to serve one another. And so before we get into the heart of the passage, I just want to give a quick preliminary remarks regarding some of the points that I made last week. If you look at the book of Romans, it's about 16 chapters. And the first 11 chapters, many of us know, are full of theological and difficult doctrines. Some parts are easy, but others are a little bit difficult. But it's very doctrinal. It's very theological. It is, in other words, those doctrines that the church are to believe. But when you get to chapter 12, many of us may know that Paul makes a transition and he moves from deep theology to very practical application. And the way I chose to teach this and preach from this last or a couple of weeks ago was what chapters 1 through 11 deal with the indicatives of the Christian life and chapters 12 through 16 deal with the imperatives. And so in other words, in chapters 1 through 11, when he deals with doctrine and then chapter 12, he moves through application, he, to- he tells us what the church is ought to believe and then he goes out of that, this is what the Christian life should look like and this is how you ought to live. But what's interesting to note in this really construction of the Apostle Paul is that right at the center between chapters 1 through 11 and 12 through 16, right in the middle at the end of chapter 11, he goes into a doxology. A doxology, we just sang it as part of our liturgy, doxology. Doxa is a word that means glory, and ology can be grounded in the word logos. So essentially, a doxology is a word of glory. And so Paul, in his thinking about the Christian life, he's essentially saying, I believe, your doctrine should lead you to doxology, and your doxology should be the beginning of your application. And so as we think about this, this is how I want us to understand and approach this passage, that there is a doctrine that leads to doxology, and as we begin the application, it is grounded in praise or a word of glory to our Savior here this morning. 
In other words, Paul says once again, that is the indicative and that is the imperative. I want to spend a little bit of time on the indicative imperative again, and this is still the preliminary remarks, so forgive me for being a little bit longer in the introduction, but Michael Horton in his book, A Better Way, illustrates this very clearly, I thought, and he says it in this way. He says, imagine that you have a medical student that goes to med school, and he goes through the the uh, very difficult time of studying to be a doctor, he graduates and then he gets his degree, his MD, and then he goes through his uh, residency or perhaps his uh, fellowship, and he wants to focus and specialize upon being a surgeon. And so he grows through this difficult time, and for the first time in his life, he is a full-blown doctor, and he goes into the operating room for the first surgery in which he will conduct the surgery for, by his complete leadership and by his own ability. And so Michael Horn elaborates and he says, imagine that this doctor goes for his first surgery and then all of a sudden he thinks about how he didn't do too well on his past exams. Or he thinks to himself, I'm not sure if I'm really cut out to do this. And he thinks, well, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm not sure if I'm going to perform the operation correctly. And so he's just standing still at the operating table until the nurse says, doctor, what are you doing? And he responds, I'm not really sure. I'm just very insecure about myself. And then the nurse replies and says, you're a doctor now. Perform the operation. See, the indicative is the reality of what is. She says, you're a doctor now. And in light of that, perform the operation. See, the Apostle Paul in verses or chapters 1 to 11, he essentially tells you what he has done in his son Jesus Christ to redeem a, per, a people for himself. And before he gets to the indicatives of the application, he's telling each and every one of you, you are redeemed in Christ now. You are righteous in Jesus Christ now. In light of that indicative and that truth, now live out who you are in your son. And so when we come to these passages, we come here, I want us to understand that our obedience in the commandments that we are to live flow out of the reality that we have first been newly created in Jesus Christ. If you look at verse 3, Paul keys off and he says, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. And so when we begin the application, Paul begins and essentially says, I say to everyone not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. And Paul is very clever. He's using a play on words because four times here, he uses the very root word of think. And the way that I like to translate this very loosely is in this way. I'd like to translate it and say, I say to everyone among you, not to high think yourself or up think yourself, but to wise think or to sober think according to the measure of faith that has been given. And he says, if you want to live the Christian life, you need to have a tendency that wise thinks yourself or to sober think yourself, not to upthink or to high think or to overthink, but to right think or to be sober thinking about yourselves. And so this morning, I want us to look at two points in which the Apostle Paul exhorts us and teaches us to wise think ourselves or to sober think ourselves. And the two points essentially is this. One, I want us to look at our unity as one church. And in that unity, point number two, I want us to look at a diversity, an individuality, but also a community. And so they're intertwined. So point number one, our unity. Verse three, again, will take our point of departure. Verse three says, to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, I begin on this verse because I want to talk about the notion of faith because the understanding of living as a community and diversity really brings into view the notion of faith. And that's really one of those doctrines that I find are very confusing among people in the church because I hear this sort of statement or thinking many times. Uh, if someone is sick, the encouragement is usually have more faith and then you'll be healed. Or if you're studying, or you're trying to get a promotion, or you're trying to deal with a difficult situation in your family, usually the exhortation is, have more faith, and everything will be all right. And I understand what they're saying, but it's not exactly the right way, because it doesn't understand faith properly, because it's focusing our attention not upon the object of our faith, but upon the results of our faith. Healing, better relationships, maybe a promotion, better grades, 
And so I want to begin with faith because I want to correct if some of us here are a little bit confusing about this, that faith ultimately is not about the results, but it has an object. Faith essentially is extrospective and not introspective. It's not inward looking, but it is outward looking. So when you think about faith, your direction and your position is to look upward and forward because it is essentially extrospective. As a professor of mine once said, he said, if Jesus Christ is the Son, your faith should be like the sunflower so that wherever Jesus Christ goes, your orientation follows it along the same lines. And brothers and sisters, the most important thing about your faith is not the quality or the strength, not, not the most important, but the most important quality or aspect about your faith is the object of your faith. Let me illustrate it in this way. Imagine, this, this is really difficult for Californians to imagine, but imagine actually there, it's cold and it's actually wintry. And uh, imagine that you actually go to a local lake where it's actually been frozen over. And so you want to go ice skating on there and you realize that the ice has frozen over, let's say about two feet. So no matter what, you could go out there and do whatever you want because the ice is thick and it will sustain your weight. But for some reason, you're still a little bit scared. You know, you've never seen like a frozen lake living in California. You don't really understand necessarily the nature of ice and its uh, physical properties. And so you think that you could go out there and ice skate, but because you're so scared, you're just crawling out on there. And you're slowly just crawling out, not really ice skating. But because the object of your faith is very strong, you're going to be sustained and you're not going to fall through, even though your belief in your faith is very weak as you're crawling out there. See, on the second scenario, you can imagine another lake that's very thin, and surely it's not going to support the weight of one person's body, but you believe within all of your heart that, yes, it will sustain my weight. You believe within all your heart, no matter what, I could go out there and I could do all kinds of tricks on my ice skates. And so immediately you go out there, and then you fall through, and you're completely drenched with the cold water. Because you see, even though your faith was strong, the object of your faith was weak, and that's why you fell through. Brothers and sisters, I bring this into view because it's not a matter of having a lot of faith or strong faith because everyone is built with faith. The issue is, what is the object of your faith? See, is your faith that brings you source and security and reassurance and comfort and joy? Is the object of that faith ultimately in your children? And children are great, don't get me wrong. Or is it ultimately in your careers? And I wish actually everybody would be rich and make a lot of money, so then you could use it for a kingdom purpose. But is your faith and the object of your faith ultimately in your own personality or your gifting or your abilities? Because if it ultimately is in some of those worldly aspects, all of which are good in of themselves, but if that is the object of your faith for the source of your security, then I'm here to tell you here this morning, you are walking on thin ice. And eventually, you'll find out whatever you believe that will give you satisfaction and joy is going to fail you. It's going to be difficult unless the object of your faith is upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 3, it says to sober think or to wise think or to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God gives. And so with this perspective of faith, Paul is telling us we need to understand that we are one inextricably bound up together. That this is the unity in verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ Jesus. One way by which we may wise think ourselves is to have a perspective on the church that is not first and foremost me, myself, and I, but one that has a perspective in which we view our identities and our agendas and our objectives together as one body in Jesus Christ. I was talking to a student once at Westminster Seminary. He was from Africa, and he was sharing me a different perspective that he has compared to many Westerners, and he directed me to a quote by Desmond Tutu in a book called No Future Without Forgiveness, and it was really insightful, and he brought this notion because he himself even said that Westerners are very individualistic. You know, you go to the mall and you go to the food court, there's just any choice that you have for your own individual personal preferences. And he says, in Africa, in this particular tribe and nation, it's not necessarily like that. They think much more communally. And so for him to be in America, he had to adjust. And in this book, No Future Without Forgiveness, Desmond Tutu, who was a famous opponent of the apartheid, he was a first black South African Anglican Archbishop, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984, he writes this about an idea that is very pervasive in his culture and it's called Ubuntu. Ubuntu. And this is what he says about this notion. 
Ubuntu is very difficult to render in Western language. It is to say my humanity is caught up, is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life. We say a person is a person through other persons. It is not I think, therefore I am. It rather says I am a human being because I belong, I participate, I share. A person with Ubuntu is available and open to others, affirming others, does not feel threatened that others are able and good, for he or she has a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that he or she belongs in a greater whole and is diminished when others are humiliated and while others are tortured or oppressed or treated as if they were no less than you are. Yes, you are an individual, but Paul is saying by faith, you are inextricably bound up as one body in Christ. And the primary mode of operation is one in which we are a covenant community, a body of Christ that we live together. We are one body, and this being the case, the arm does not think it better than the leg, and the foot does not think it better than the hand, because we need one another as we are a community that strives and perseveres to persevere on in obedience with faith in Jesus Christ. There's a communal mentality and a communal perspective that Paul wants us to get across, a communal approach. And verse 5 says that this communal approach is one that we appropriate by faith in Jesus Christ. The common denominator here, brothers and sisters, the common denominator is not going to be our ethnicity. The common denominator for our unity is not going to be our socioeconomic background. The common denominator for us as a believer and as a church is going to be the person and work of Jesus Christ. In John 17, Jesus prays his high priestly prayer, and he says that the disciples, and he prays that the disciples may be one. So in other words, if you ask the question in a broad perspective, what is the evidence that Jesus Christ came and did what he was called to do to bring salvation and redemption to his people? Jesus' prayer in John 17 seems to be saying the oneness of the church, the unity of the church. And so as we think about this, I want to encourage and exhort everyone here this morning that everyone has their agenda about church. Everyone has their agenda for their own personal lives. But to set back for a moment and take a wide-angle view and say, you know what? God wants us to understand by faith we are a unity and a community. And therefore, the decisions we make and the agendas that we have should not be geared by individuality, but by community as a church that believes in the person and work of Jesus Christ here this morning. So that's our unity. Point number two is our diversity. A diversity. Verses 4 to 5, if I could direct your attention, this is what it says. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one another. In other words, in this unity is also diversity or individuality. And actually, that is one notion that really brings out the beauty of church. If I asked you the question, how would you define beauty? What is beautiful? It's not that easy, actually, to define what beauty is. But I think that in Reformed history, there is a doctrine of beauty, although not perfect, but there is a notion that beauty comes with unity and diversity. And in one sense, is exemplified most climactically in the church here this morning. So in other words, beauty is not necessarily in the eye of the beholder, but it is unity and multiplicity. Or rather, it is diversity that's brought into harmony. So you musicians may be able to resonate with this. You have an individual notes, you know, individual notes that are scattered. But if they're not brought into unity or harmony, you won't have music, but you'll just have noise. Or if you think, you know, for a more superficial example, you look at a supermodel on the magazines or on TV, and you say, physically, they're so beautiful, aren't they? Well, why? Because there is a unity and diversity within the physicality of their parts. There's a symmetry and there's a proportion. So physically, they're very beautiful, but then, you know, hypothetically, you meet them, and they're very arrogant, or they're very condescending, and, you know, they're not very nice, and all of a sudden, that physical beauty is diminishing. You say, oh, that's actually an ugly person. Well, why? Because there's no harmony or unity between the outward beauty and the inward beauty of her character. Beauty needs unity and diversity, and that's why it's ultimately grounded, and I know this is very theological, in the Trinity, where it's one God, but also 
three persons. And so that is why at the end of the day, we have beauty in which the most beautiful person is not someone who's just externally beautiful, but one who actually has the character of Christ so that their character is in harmony with their outward appearance. And so I bring this into view here because when Paul says in verses 4 to 5, we are one body, but at the same time, we are many individually members one of another, New Life Mission Church, as a local church, should display the very beauty of God in our unity as well as in our individuality, as well as our personal individual aspects that are in harmony with one another. But Paul here is more specific when he comes to talk about our diversity. He says that when you wise think yourself or sober think yourself, it will show in the use of your gift. He said he doesn't just say, well, there's unity and diversity, but a true unity and diversity will show itself in the life of the church in which every believer will use his or her own gift in order to serve one another. Now, if you look at verse 3 again, there is a phrase that I found to be the most difficult, and it is the phrase, measure of faith, in verse 3. It's probably the most difficult phrase for me to translate or to explain. But Paul is really saying, as an individual, as you part of a body and community, the way that you live out God's will for your life is that you need to use your gift, and everyone has one, use your gift in the context, in the community of the church. But the way that you want to do this is going to be through the measure of faith. Now, what does that mean, the measure of faith? You may, you may think it's actually the quantity of faith. You know, some people have, you know, a little bit of faith. Other people have a little bit more, and other people have, like, gallons and gallons of faith. But I actually don't believe that's actually the point. I think when the Apostle Paul writes measure of faith, I take him to understand that he is saying whatever gift that you have, you need to use that gift within the sphere of your faith or in the range or in the limit of your faith. Well, what does that really mean there? No, use your gift within the sphere or the realm or the range of your faith. When I was in youth ministry, there was a student of mine who, you know, honestly, sometimes I just wanted to smack him across the head because he just didn't really get it. But at one point in Bible study, he said this. He said, Pastor Will, uh, I play uh, violin in my school orchestra, and he wanted to play for the New York Philharmonic. And he says, but I'm the second chair violinist. And the first chair violinist who's better He's not even a believer. So shouldn't I be the first chair violinist because I believe in God? And I didn't know how to answer that. I just wanted to smack on his head again. But <laughs> what I wanted to share with him is really this. And this is the point of using your gift within the realm and the sphere of your faith. God has gifted every one of you. But if God has gifted you to be the second chair violinist, the point is to use that gift and be a second chair violinist. Don't stretch your gift and say, I'm going to try to function as a first chair violinist. And at the same time, don't say, well, if I'm not the best, then there's no purpose or need for my gift, and you don't play violin at all. But to use your gift in the range or the sphere of which you are called to live. Now, I use this illustration all the time in the East Coast, and they hate it, but I bring in to view the Lakers and Kobe Bryant, and they say, you know, you ever play ball, and there's sometimes there's that notion where there's a guy who's very solid. You know, he could be on the team, but he always thinks like he's the best player on the team. You know, so if you think about it, if you are gifted, but you're not gifted to be the leader or the captain of the team, don't stretch your gift to be the Kobe Bryant of the team. Just function and play like you're a Ron Artest. But at the same time, if you're gifted to play like Ron Artest, don't say, well, I'm not the Kobe Bryant, I'm just going to sit on the bench because no one needs me, but use your gifting in the range or in the limit or in the sphere of what you have been called to have and gifted with and use that in the church. Some of you are very gifted leaders, and some of you are not gifted leaders but want to be a leader. Some of you are really gifted at serving an organization, and other of you may want to do that, but you're not necessarily gifted in that. And my encouragement here this morning is to make you realize each and every one of you is gifted, but to use that gift and discern what is the range or the sphere of that gifting in which you are called to live out your gift. Everyone needs a gift from someone else, but at the same time, everyone has a gift that they have been given by Christ to use and to serve. And so never think, no one in this church needs my gift, but use it to serve. But also, don't always think you gotta be the most visible or the best at everything that you do, because you may not have the range or limit of that particular gift 
No one has it all, but everyone has something. And so when we wise think ourselves here this morning, remember, you are inextricably bound up with one another. And as John Calvin has says, all the gifts were meant to operate together as one organic whole. They were meant to intermingle and to serve one another in the very life of the church. And when that happens, the beauty of the church and the glory of God will be displayed. My closing exhortation here this morning, brothers and sisters, is to take your faith seriously as you look to Christ and to realize that even though this church and all of us have gone through very difficult, perhaps, or transitory times, that ultimately the bedrock of how you will feel comfortable is going to be by looking upward to Jesus Christ and to realize that that is a common denominator that everyone in this room has and to appropriate that reality as you continue to persevere and to serve with the gift that you have in the measure of faith that has been given to you by God. Let us bow our heads in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have saved us, and we also thank you that you have commanded us. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you we convict each and every one of our hearts here this morning to look to Jesus Christ as the object and the perfecter of our faith, the champion of our faith, Lord, and help that to be the main common denominator in all of our lives, the bedrock of our security and our, our faith, our comfort, our joy. And Lord, may that be the transforming power in which together, individually yet communally, we live out your will for our lives as we use our gifts to serve one another. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do this. We have confidence that you will because you have promised it to us in your word. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.